Hi, <laughs> my name is Scott Weinkiewicz, and uh, I am filling in for a Levi Sim as the host of today's Reflection on Mirrorless. But before we get into it, please know, like I mentioned a little while ago, I lost my voice, so I will not be speaking too much. So with that, um, hello, Ken. <laughs> hello, how are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, can you please share a bit about yourself for everyone who doesn't already know who you are? All right. So my name is Ken Hubbard. I do work for Tamron USA. My title technically is called field service manager. And I basically have uh, about seven tech reps that work for me. We uh, are normally crisscrossing the country, uh, teaching workshop seminars in dealers and such around the country, trade shows and all that. But right now, it's sort of the virtual world. I'm also a professional photographer and I do a lot of photography and video uh, work for Tamron as well. So I've been doing this quite a long time. I think Tamron, did I say uh, I've been with them 20 years? So this year was 20 years with Tamron. Were you <laughs> ever at uh, Mac Cameron Video Service in Springfield, New Jersey? Yes, I was. <laughs> so you and I, yes, you and I probably met. Right yeah. Yeah. You, you and I probably met many, many years ago when I worked at that store. Uh, I know Patty was the sales has probably still is a sales rep for that store, still but it's a sales rep there. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I worked there. I worked there probably um, I would say probably about 12 to 15 years ago. Um, yeah, so. there you go. We've yeah, we've yeah. crossed paths then there for sure. Yeah, I'm sure. I think we just did a uh, last time I was there was with, with the pandemic and the time, everything's thrown off. I'm going to, I, I want to say it was just before the pandemic, we did a Lakota Wolf workshop with them. So, oh, yes, 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 yes. I do remember when they were, when they were planning that and promoting that. So, um, yeah, that's a cool place too. Yep. Um, so uh, before we dive into, I got a, a few questions for Ken before he dives into his presentation, but I just want to let everybody know there is a Q&A section in this webinar. And if you have any questions for Ken now or during his presentation, please open up that Q&A module, ask the question, and then after the presentation, we're going to be going through the questions and Ken will be able to uh, answer everything that he can. Um, yep. And if there's any duplicate questions, I'm just going to mark it as you know, answered or something like that. And because there's no point in having duplicates there, but we appreciate the questions anyway. Um, <laughs> so um, my first question to you is uh, what camera are you using these days? Ah, oh, that's a great question. I use multiple. As far as mirrorless goes, uh, it's the Sony 7R3, the 6600 7 III. Uh, DSLR is the D500 and the 850. Um, nice. but at any given time, it's whatever camera I have in my hand. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I can't go without asking, um, what is sort of your, your go-to lens for the mirrorless system? That you have? The mirrorless system, uh, for the mirrorless Sony system, I would say more often than not the 2875 DI3, uh, by Tamron, that is, uh, probably my fallback lens and just the way I see the world outside of that 17 to 28 and 28 to 200 are the other two that I probably use the most. Those three are where I am, but the 28 to 75 most likely is 75% of the images end up being in that with that lens. Yeah. So, so, uh, for most of your night photography, is you, would you, would you say that is your that's your that's your typical well, or for night. I'm probably going a little bit wider, uh, 17 mm -hmm. to 28, um, since this is a night photography. And I will admit it's been the past year now during COVID that I'm slowly switching from the DSLR to the mirrorless for night photography. Mm -hmm. It was just you got in such a comfort zone uh, with, <laughs> you know, the the. Tamron 15 to 30 was such a lens for night photography that now I'm switching over. I'm actually, we have a new lens coming out, a 11 to 20 for the, the APS-C size. And I'm fortunate enough to get a sample of it already. And I actually went down to DC and did some stuff down in DC with it. And that might become used more and more in my <laughs> nighttime stuff just because of the size factor is so awesome with it oh yeah yeah, yeah. 
that's it's, that's that's gotta be fun when you get to uh, play with lenses that aren't available to the world yet and yeah. nobody nobody knows that like you could be sharing a photo with it nobody would ever know <laughs> i will say yeah it's a, it's a fun perk because i even with my tech team i've had stuff in my bag and that i'm working with one of my techs and they're like what's in your bag i go nothing <laughs> and then there's just science and they know there's something in there that, <laughs> that i just can't, can't tell them so yeah it's kind of fun sometimes that is, um so and my last question is uh, before you dive into your presentation is what is your absolute favorite location for night photography oh wow uh, that is a great great question because i hate to say that there's multiple one of my most recent favorite is glacier national park because it is so dark and the amount of stars you see are just tremendous. And that just happened recently in the past two years, we did a, a workshop out there when we finally added the night element to it. And when we got to two medicine, I just had to stare at the sky for a while because I was like, wow, you were East coaster. So when you yeah. get that dark of a sky, you're like, yeah, wow. because most places you go, there'll be, you know, you go to Arches National Park, you got Moab, you, every, there's always usually a town within 10 or 15 miles. And there it's just darkness. So it was, I would say right now, that's where I want to go back to next and shoot again real soon. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that's, um, haven't been there yet, but uh, also one of those one day things. <laughs> but yeah, you know, as, as an East Coaster, like you said, once you get to a spot, where it's just pitch black and you get to just soak up the natural sky without light pollution. It is like, it, it is, it's like, it's like you're in another world. Oh yeah. It really it's, is. it's just, it's beautiful. It's that's the only word for it. It's just beautiful. So yeah. Cool. So um, why don't we uh, dive right in at this point? All right. Cool. So I'll go and share my screen. So, nope. Cannot not share it yet. Is it not letting you? Nope, I don't think I have a uh, hosted disabled participants screen sharing. So, okay. so one second. That. Now right. try. There we go. Uh, we can share. I haven't gotten this one before. Okay. okay. Oh, up there we go. Now we're cooking with fire. <laughs> And you should be able to see it. And then play slideshow. All good? All good on this end. All right. Thanks. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, today's presentation is going to be on night photography, but it's not just going to be about stars. It's night photography in general, because you can take this idea of shooting at night anywhere uh, and capture images. Uh, this particular image is uh, at the Lofoten Islands in Norway. Uh, it seemed like a great idea to go there in December because there was very limited amount of light. Um, daylight because the days are so short. I think the last day we were there, the sun never broke the horizon. So uh, you were thinking, wow, we have all this darkness to shoot, but didn't realize that in December, and this is why you do your research, in December, the Gulf Stream actually comes across there. And we may have had a total of five days there, maybe two hours of clear sky, maybe. <laughs> so it didn't really work out for us for a, a night photography. And this was about a 20, a 20 minute period uh, that we were staying in those little fishing huts down there and it broke for a second. We ran out and started shooting. So sometimes, you know, it's a, a little bit more difficult than you would like it to be, but to make it, less difficult when it comes to actually capturing the images. You really, this is one type of photography, you really have to understand your camera's controls. And what I mean by that, you're gonna take, camera, uh, take control of your camera and shoot mostly in manual, if not all manual, most of the time. And I don't mean just aperture, shutter, and ISO, you're gonna be manually focusing as well but really taking command and getting to know aperture, shutter, and ISO. And I know some of you are probably saying, well, yeah, I kind of got that. I know how it all works. 
but it's still the same. Even though it's darker out, you still have to look at the images you're creating the same way as in what kind of depth of field do I want? Uh, you know, how, do I want a lot, a little? What am I trying to create here? So using your aperture, your shutter and your ISO all together and correctly is extremely important. As we know with aperture, the, the smaller the number, the wider open that aperture inside your lens is, letting in more light, shallower depth of field, stopping it down, F16, F22, and so on. Smaller opening, less light, larger depth of field. So you're thinking to yourself probably like, well, it's nighttime. I'm always going to be shooting at this end, the, the, the open end of it, F28, F14, F5, something like that. Not necessarily. So here in this case, not because I need the light. I'm actually on a monopod in uh, Washington, D.C. at the Korean Memorial. I could have stopped down and got a little bit more depth of field here and still been able to get a sharp image because I was on a monopod, but I didn't want that because of the background elements here. The other soldiers and those lights in the background were a little distracting. So I wanted to isolate this guy, this main soldier here from that background. So he pops out a little bit more and your eye goes to him because your eye's gonna go to the sharpest point. So I'm still thinking, even though it's dark out, it's not so much controlling my aperture to allow more light in, but what do I need to do with that aperture as well? So don't forget to do stuff like that. But then there's cases where you do have to open it up to 2.8. There's no if, when, or buts. If you're going to shoot the Milky Way and do pinpoint stars, and it's a new moon, which means there's no moon out or the moon has set or hasn't risen yet, it is gonna be so dark that with, with the proper settings, you're gonna have to open up as wide as you can to uh, allow yourself to absorb that much light. In this case, it's F2.8. And I'm gonna go into all the settings throughout this presentation. So I'm gonna build through it. So just remember certain circumstances, this because there isn't much light, I definitely need that 2.8. This case, I had enough light to stop down, plus I was on my monopod, but I didn't because of that background. But then there's night photography thing like, well, again, I got to open up. I got to uh, allow for a lot of light to come in. But in this case, this is the New York City High Line. I need that depth of field because I'm so close to that foreground subject. The bench in front of me is only about eight inches away. I want that in focus and I want the buildings in the background in focus. So now, you know, I have to stop down my aperture. I have to use that aperture to get that larger depth of field. So... In most of my photography, be it nightscapes or landscapes or anything like that, or portraiture, usually the first thing I'm thinking about is my aperture. What is it I'm looking to do? Am I isolating a subject as in the uh, Korean War Memorial, or am I including everything as in this scene here of the New York City High Line? Uh, portraiture could be, you know, how much do I want how much depth of field do I want in the face? Do I just want the eyes and everything else soft or not? So it is the same for almost every type of image that I take, a landscape, whatever. I usually always start with that aperture and what do I need to do to create the image I'm looking for? Oop, here we go. Even with the scene like this, where the first thing I'm thinking about is this is down in Apalachicola, Georgia. Um, I have a, a pretty close to a full moon, but I wanna make it look like it's full and I wanna give that sunburst effect, but use it with the moon. So that's why I stopped down to F16 in this case. Not so much so I have a longer exposure. I could have got a long enough exposure to soften that water, but my first thought is I wanted to get that burst effect in the moon, like a lot of times what people do with sunsets or sunrises when it's just coming over that horizon, you get those, those starburst effect coming out from it. And that's what I was thinking. Let's, let's play around with that and do it with the moon instead. So again, still the first thing I'm thinking about is that aperture. But then once I have the aperture of what I'm looking to do and what I need to do, the next thing I think about is, is Going to my shutter speed, what do I need to do at my shutter speed to create the image I'm looking for? The faster the shutter speed, the more you're going to freeze something. The slower the shutter, the more blurry it's going to be. But the longer it stays open, 
the more light that's going to come in and allow you to light your scene correctly so you can get that proper exposure. I've set my aperture to f16 because once you see what this scene is, you're going to see why. I needed a lot of depth of field, so I stopped down. Next step, what did I do? I'm starting to work with my shutter speed here. I'm at 1.6 seconds. And you can tell maybe there's some buildings back there and some greenery off to the left over here. But what else is going on in the scene? You can't see it because it's so underexposed. So I go to 13 seconds. Now that shutter is staying open for 13 seconds, still at F16, still at the same ISO. I'm at, uh, if I remember correctly, ISO 400 in this case. Still not long enough. I go to 15 seconds, then 20 seconds. And finally, by using that shutter speed, I get a closer to proper exposure. To me, actually, it's probably closer to 18 seconds. It would have been slightly, slightly better for me. But just for the examples, I went to 20. The other thing, you're probably going to yourself, well, why didn't you just raise your ISO as well? I could do that. I uh, surely can. I could have went to 3,200, really brought down my shutter speed. But if you notice, this is the New York City High Line again. And there's always people walking on here. So I wanted the longest shutter speed possible so I would not get any people in my frame. If you look really, 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 really closely along that path, you do see some ghosting. And that's because of this really bright light underneath this bench that is reflecting off the sides of the bodies of all those passers by. And believe it or not, when you place your foot as you're walking, you stop for a second. So that little split second stop and that light hitting it caused a slight ghosting in there. But I pretty much got rid of anybody and you might not have noticed it if I didn't point it out. So, you know, I'm always thinking about how long do I need my shutter speeds to be? Uh, what do my, what do I need my aperture to be? But also understand the longer you go, you're also going to get movement in, in your landscapes as in, if there's gonna be clouds in your scene, this is Rocky Mountain National Park and the weather just started coming in. We were trying to shoot some night sky stuff um, and we're pointing away from Estes Park, the town of Estes Park, and these clouds started racing in. So at a 20 second exposure, I purposely wanted to do that, to give that movement in that sky, uh, to just you know, do something a little bit different because the scene really wasn't panning out the way I wanted it to. But you can also use that longer exposures to do your star trails. There's multiple ways to do star trails in the sense that you can do it where you take that single picture um, at say 20 seconds, ISO 3200, F2.8, and you use an intervalometer to take a, a picture every say 25 seconds over an hour and then stack them together. Uh, you can use uh, star stacks or something like that to do it that way. But the old way uh, for us that shot film, if you wanted to do something like this, was just doing a very, very, very long exposure. And in this case, 17 minutes was OK. You got I got the effect of it here in um, Arches National Park. But I had to stop at 17 minutes. I wanted to go longer. I wanted to go for about an hour or so. But every single time I tried to take the picture, a group of hikers would walk by with their lights on and stuff like that. So I got about 17 minutes. But I did get a nice little uh, shooting star going almost perfectly horizontal through the scene. But this is just to give you that example of what you can do, what happens when you start doing these longer and longer exposures as well. The third thing I work with to balance out what I want my aperture to be and what I want my shutter speed to be based on the image. It's always based on the image I'm trying to create is then I go to the ISO and play with that. The nice thing about um, mirrorless camera systems and digital cameras today is that you can really start bumping up that ISO way further than when our old uh, film days. I don't know if anybody's out there used TMAX 3200 way back when black and white film, but that was when you were trying to create those artsy images because there was so much grain in it that it was, it was pretty bad. But <laughs> so 
our, our friend from Barbados. Uh, here is uh, really a, a, one of the beaches that was close to uh, the house that we rented out there. And obviously this is not a night scene, but just to talk to you a little bit about ISO, the lower the number, the less sensitive your sensor is. So on a super bright day in Barbados and you have this nice catamaran going by in the background, you can shoot easily at ISO 100. But as the day goes on or as the day begins, in this case, in Joshua Tree, um, I had to start bumping up my ISO because I had left my tripod in my car. And what am I looking at here in the sense of, first, my aperture, I'm stopping down because I want the jo Joshua Tree that's in front of me in focus and all the way through to the mountains in the background all in focus. So I had to stop down my aperture to F16. Next. Uh, my shutter speed, because I left my tripod in the car and with the 24 to 70 VC vibration compensation, I can handhold down to about a quarter second or an eighth of a second with this fairly easily. So with that combination of a quarter second and my aperture at F16, to get the proper exposure, I had to go to ISO 800, but with the digital cameras today, the, the mirrorless systems today, I have no hesitation doing that whatsoever. Then as it gets darker, and here this is Yosemite National Park, but on a very crescent moon night. Um, and it's amazing. We were talking about in the beginning how, you know, he asked me where was one of my favorite places. And I said, Glacier National Park. And the last time I was there doing night skies, there was no moon. It was a new moon. So it was pitch black. And it takes a little while for your eyes to adjust, but you end up seeing, you know, the, the pathway in front of you and stuff like that, even without a moon. So when you have a night like this in Yosemite, where the crescent moon was still up and hitting El Capitan, it almost looks like daylight. It almost looks like I shot El Capitan during the day. Then I went back and shot a night scene and I cropped the two together. I composited the two together, which I didn't. This is one scene. It's just that crescent moon gives off so much light, allowing me to easily shoot this at 1600. I was able to lower it. I didn't have to bump it up too much. But then again, going back to that magic number of 3200, um, here, because there is no moon, no extra light at all to get the Milky Way and to get the stars, I needed to go to 3200. I'll say this a few times just so everybody can remember it or write it down. The normal settings, what I'm shooting at when I'm shooting a scene like this, as in the Milky Way with pinpointed stars, is I'm going to be using the widest angle lens I can. And in this case, uh, it's a 15 to 30 for mirrors of systems. Uh, so like the Sony, I'm going to be using the 17 to 28 at 17 millimeters. The reason why is I want it as wide as possible to get as much of that sky as possible. Next thing I'm going to talk about my aperture. I'm going to have to open up that aperture all the way to F 2.8. If I have a faster lens, I'm going to go even wider. So open it as wide as you can F 2.8 or better. Next is shutter speed. We talked about shutter speed and movement. Because the Earth is moving, <laughs> if I go too long of a shutter speed, 17 minutes, you saw what happened. You, you get streaks. The, the stars become streaks. The same thing will happen uh, when you're shooting wide angle at a point towards the Milky Way. You can only go so long before these stars start becoming ovals. And there's, a, there's an equation I'm gonna go over at the end that is one basic equation I'll talk about a little bit more. But I'm usually at no more than 25 seconds with the widest angle lens that I have. Um, and the reason why is so I don't get any movement and 3,200. So 2.8, 25 seconds, ISO 3,200 with the widest lens that I can possibly have. So I'll repeat that a, a number of times. What's in my camera bag at any given time? Um, 
I'm going to have to update this one because now it's APS-C. We, Tamron does have a new lens coming out that's going to work really, really well for night sky. So if you're an APS-C mirrorless shooter, we're coming out with an 11 to 20 f2.8, which is going to be ideal for night sky photography. So that now is becoming my APS system, the, the Sony 6600 with the, uh, the 11 to 20, 28, uh, and the 17 to 70. Full frame, DSLR, wide angle, all that stuff. But my mirrorless system, 17 to 28, 28 to 75, and 20 millimeter for night photography. Those are my go-tos uh, for when I'm traveling about. So filters, there is a bunch of filters you can use now for night skies that will filter out uh, some of the light out of uh, the sky and color balance better, but also diffuse some of the atmospheric haze that's there. Uh, there are a number out there. I don't know their names. Um, I tend to do it in post-production, take that out, but there are some really good filters out there as well. Other accessories that you'll definitely need. You will need a tro tripod. I cannot handhold 20 seconds. Um, I'd be surprised if most of you can, but if you can, more power to you that I cannot hold 20 seconds. So a good sturdy tripod. Uh, a lot of times people, this is one place where they kind of go, well, I'm going to go a little bit more affordable, smaller, lighter, smaller, lighter, sometimes out in the field at night can be very detrimental to your equipment. If very, you can knock over your tripod with camera and lens on it very easily. Uh, go with something a little more sturdy and a little bit uh, heftier. Shutter release cable or a remote, uh, very important. So you don't have to touch your camera once it's set up. You don't wanna press that shutter release or shake the camera at all because with these longer exposures, any little movement's gonna show up in your image as a blur, motion blur, um, or little check marks in the stars and stuff like that. A flashlight, not only to get to your location safely, but also to paint with light. Think about that. I'm going to show you some images that we uh, painted with light as well. So you use it to, to paint your subjects and light them up while you're out there. Speaking of which, we're going to talk about uh, lenses and wide angle and why first. Here, this is a scene which actually doesn't look like it's painted with light, but it is. Uh, I'm trying to do this in the sense this is near my house, this is Cap Tree State Park. And I just uh, went out in the early stages of COVID last year of April because I was starting to get a little, after a month, getting a little um, uh, claustrophobic inside. So I just said, I have to get out and shoot some night skies. And I had some fun down there. And what I did is I washed the boardwalk here with a little bit of light from my flashlight to make it look like it's a soft light that's behind me. And this is why I say, always have a flashlight with you. If I didn't have that, all there would be is sort of a black silhouette there that you can't really make out what the scene is. And the reason why wide angle for night, like I said earlier, so you get as much of that sky as possible. It also makes for very dramatic images as far as your foreground subject to your background subjects in the sense that here, this looks like it's a really, really wide boardwalk, but maybe it's five or six feet wide. And that's because I'm really close to it, making looking, making that foreground look really wider and, and, and bigger than it actually is and makes the boardwalk look a lot longer than it is as well. So I use it as a creative technique. I will use my wide to normal, say a 24 to 70 or a 28 to 75 for the mirrorless system as well, because they are faster, f2.8. And sometimes I don't need that that wide. And as I was saying earlier, he, uh, they asked what was my favorite focal length. And yeah, 24 to 70 for DSLR, 2875 for the mirrorless systems. I always go to, so I do use it for night as well. Believe it or not, I'll use telephoto lenses for night photography as well. I know some have gone telephoto lenses, but again, where wide angle stretches things out, telephoto compresses. And that's what I wanted to do here. The World War II Memorial, the golden uh, star wall, 
and the Lincoln Memorial and back, I wanted to make them look a lot closer than they actually are. So I use this at 300 millimeters. This is actually taken from the lawn of the Washington uh, Monument. So I shot across the street and because I use 300 millimeters, it compressed it compress the wall and the Lincoln Memorial together. If I shot this with the wide angle, say the, the 11 to 20 or the 17 to 28, the Lincoln Memorial would look really tiny and that wasn't the look I'm going for. So like anything else, landscapes or nature or whatever it is i'm always thinking about what i'm trying to do and just because it's night doesn't mean you can't do it it just you know we'll have to sometimes think of it a little different way other lenses i really like for night if you're doing street photography primes a single prime because they're fast 1.8 1.4s allow you to handheld uh easily in the back streets and they tend to be smaller so it's really nice uh, for the mirrorless systems, we got the 20, 24, and 35 millimeter that are really super light and super small. Really nice stuff. And I, again, all-in-one lenses, just because it's getting darker doesn't mean I don't use them. Uh, all-in-ones here was just easier to move about. I didn't know what the people were going to do. This guy just walked up, so I had to zoom out quickly go a little bit wider than what I was shooting to add him into the scene. So having that all in one zoom will help you as well. So there are a lot of options when it comes to lenses and shooting at night. Next, I'm going to talk about the differences of blue sky and black sky. Well, at night, <laughs> when you, you go out, you drive to your location, you get out, you take your gear and you're hiking, you look up into the sky it looks black and it looks black to our eyes because that's the way our eyes see it. But depending on the time of night and how long after sunset or how long before sunrise, that sky may change its color depending on the images, uh, and the, uh, the shutter speeds that you use and the images you're trying to create. So here you can see you have a blue to almost black sky, but that horizon is really indigo blue. When I was there, it looked black as anything, but this is about an hour and a half before sunrise. So maybe to my eyes, I can't see that ambient light that's there, but with a, a, a shutter speed of, this was about a quarter of a second, believe it or not, that I was able to capture it and get uh, just enough, just slow enough of a shutter speed that I got some of that indigo blue sky. So I'm going to show you an example going from sunset here in Zion National Park. I know, again, it's not a night sky, but it's used for example of what happens because all the images are from the same place. Here is sunset uh, at uh, the bridge over the Virgin River by uh, the junction where you can go up into the uh, canyon itself. Great place for sunset. Hits the watchman. Beautiful shot. But I came back about three hours later. And this is a great example. We get there, we're standing on the bridge and to our eyes, the sky looks black. So you'd think it's a black sky, but it's only two or so hours after sunset, allowing me with a long enough exposure, this was about a 15 or 20 second exposure at ISO 800 uh, with the about 24 millimeters here. With that long exposure, because that, that shutter is open and it's allowing light to hit that sensor, even though the sky looks black to me, there is some light there. It turns this indigo blue, which is really kind of a neat effect because when you see it, you're just like, well, I don't see that with my eyes, but boom, there it is with the camera. But the later you go into night, the, the further into the night you go now, say six, seven, eight hours, back to the same spot, just shooting at a slightly different angle. Now, because it's two o'clock in the morning, instead of say eight or nine o'clock at night, now the sky has gone black. So that's the difference going from that blue sky to black sky, knowing what you're looking for, what effects you're looking for is determined by what time you go out after the sun has set or before the sun rises. This is just long enough. You know, the sun's not rising for another four or five hours. So you still have that nice black sky. 
make your scene interesting. Don't walk away from it. Make sure your composition is really good. Um, use leading lines, focus points, scale, everything like that. It's all part of night photography. Just it's not just that Milky Way going across the sky. You know, think about night photography as everything else you do in the sense of the world of landscapes or street photography or whatever it is. As simple as this, this is the Tetons uh, National Park, Grand Teton National Park, way north, almost outside the park. And this particular scene was another one where we had a really brilliant black sky and a tons and tons of stars in it. Nice little shooting star coming down over here in the top right hand uh, corner. But it was kind of a boring shot when I initially took it because all I had is a, the star with the reflection in the water. There was nothing really in the foreground to help it. So I took out my flashlight, I moved myself a little bit, and I had the pier going out into the lake come in from that bottom right-hand side as my leading light line into the water towards that star. But I didn't just shoot it like that because without lighting it because it would have just been a black blob. You wouldn't have really know what it is. So I just took my flashlight and lit it a little bit so you saw that leading line guiding you into the frame, into that silhouetted horizon, and then that mass of stars. I don't only just shoot the skies for the Milky Way. There's something about when you get a, a dark sky that has so many stars, like uh, Glacier National Park and even parts of the Grand Tetons away from Jackson, shooting away from Jackson, you can... Uh, get some really brilliant skies. See, even here over on the Idaho side, you can see some of those lights and stuff like that. So it's hard. Again, back to this scene, it's a leading line and a focal point. And what I mean by focal point is my leading line kind of takes me up. The wall takes me up to the Washington Monument. And then the lights bring me back to my main focal point of the person who came over to touch the wall. Without him there, it to me doesn't have the impact. He is the focal point of this image. The main subject of this image is the Vietnam Memorial and secondarily the, the Washington Monument, but he's the focal point. He's what makes this image. So certain images need that. They need that focal point that, that kind of draws you in and gives the image just a little bit more. And then have fun with scale because wide angle lenses and night skies and stuff like that, you're using these wide angle lenses, really can play with, with scale. This is St. Louis and the St. Louis arch with St. Louis behind it. The arch is pretty big. I mean, it's a pretty neat uh, structure and fun to photograph at night because of the lighting and everything like that. But because I'm so close to the memorial itself, that it makes it look so much bigger in scale of the city itself. It kind of dwarfs the city and makes it look like it kind of can go over the entire city. And that's playing with wide angle of that effect that when you get closer to it, it gets bigger and the subject in the background gets smaller. So have fun with scale. And you can do the same with longer focal length lenses like you saw earlier, the World War II Memorial and the Lincoln Memorial where I use the compression to make the Lincoln Memorial look bigger than it actually does to your eyes. So you can play with scale and definitely do that to create a little bit more interesting of an image. Um, here as well, you know, composition and light and stuff like that. What I try to do is, you know, I don't always light everything, but I look at where the Milky Way may go into a scene and what's there and the directions. A lot of times what I will do is push that Milky Way off to that right hand side and have it go to the left. Just like think about when you're taking a picture of something moving in a direction, be it a horse, an animal or whatever it is, you usually give a little bit more breathing space in the direction that it's going in the sense that if it's going left or right, you're gonna push it a little bit to the left so there's more room in your frame to the right. So it has something to go into, not out of the frame. I normally do that with the Milky Way, but I'm also looking at the elements in my frame that allow me to do that at night. 
in this case, compositionally, I had to push the Milky Way to the left because I had the arches over here that I wanted to keep in my frame. It also allowed me to get that star in there. That was purely accidental. But, <laughs> you know, depending on the elements, and I couldn't go any further left or right to change that perspective. I was about wherever I was standing, I know I couldn't really go any further to the right. If I started moving to the right, then my angle that I have at this would have started pushing the uh, Milky Way to the right a little bit more and maybe got it in there. But for whatever reason, I think I would have kind of fallen to my death if I went any further to the right wherever I was standing. Um, here again, compositionally, look at thirds. Rule of thirds, uh, you know, breaking that frame up into thirds is extremely important. The reason why I show this image again is because it's very simple in what I did here. It's basically breaking it into thirds with the horizon line on that lower third. And it doesn't have to be exact, just within that proximity, bringing that down to that lower third. But look at where I placed the moon as well. If you were to put a grid, two horizontal lines at thirds and two vertical lines at thirds, that moon would almost be in that, that crosshair, that PowerPoint of where kind of that, that you would put a main subject. So this is a very simple look at using that rule of thirds for composition as well, even for night stuff. Wherever you go, whatever it is, be it a cityscape like this, you saw this image already, or be it um, a landscape or you know whatever scene you're doing, don't just take one image and go. Work the scene, take as many images as possible. Um, if you only take one, then guess what? That's going to be your best image. That's it. <laughs> it's, it's, that's what it's going to be. If you take multiple, maybe the vision you had initially in your head maybe wasn't exactly the, the shot that you wanted. Maybe what you took afterwards ended up being the image that you liked the best. So here, the high line, it's very easy. I spent about two and a half hours just walking up and down it a couple of times, looking for scenes to take, looking at different ways to take it, using leading lines of the rail here, but keeping in slow shutter speed so I get the, the lights of the cars and that, those nice, nice streaks in there. Again, doing some scenes that are complex, some scenes that are a little bit more simple. Uh, this scene. For some reason, when I came back the next day, this was during Photo Plus a few years back, I was showing some friends and they're just like, everybody fell towards this image. And that's what's amazing about photography is that an image that I go, okay, yeah, I kind of like it, I guess, but it's not my favorite image of the night. Out of 10 people, I showed eight people this was their favorite image for whatever reason. I'm not 100% sure, but you know, you got to let people like what they like, I guess. I go back to this one. I, I kind of like this one because I tend to like things um, uh, in order, let's say, like, you know, nice parallel lines coming in, nice center, things in their place. And I guess that's what this particular scene does for me. Everything's sort of in its place. Okay, now the tough thing, focusing at night. Like I said early on, you're going to have to take control of your camera. And taking your co control of your camera is not just your ISO, your aperture, and your shutter. You're going to have to manually focus here. Your camera is not going to like focusing at night at all, no matter how bright those stars are. So what I tend to do, there's a couple of things that uh, you can do here. First, the most simple and the most basic, depending on the camera system you have and how good your live view handles, how much gain or how little gain it has, uh, how well it handles night skies and, and using that to focus will depend on it. If you have a camera that is just too noisy, the gain is too high, it's too noisy, you can't really see anything too clear, what I tend to do is take my lens and if it has a focus window, I put it uh, in the middle of the infinity sign. You'll have that infinity sign. That means it's focused at infinity. This is not an exact science at all, but because it's digital photography, once you have it all set up, you have your exposures correct, you did your focus, you do a test shot, what you can do is preview your image and then zoom into it then. 
And then you can see if it's slightly soft or not. And it's going to take a couple of extra shots. You know, you just kind of move it to the left or move it to the right a hair until you have it perfectly in focus. And at that point, I usually take a little bit of um, electrical tape and tape down the focus ring so it doesn't move because I don't want to have to go through that again. The second way, if you have a camera that has a good LCD screen and good live view that it can handle, what I'm going to do is I'm going to point at the one of the brightest stars in my scene. And that would probably be this guy right here next to the Milky Way. I'm going to zoom into him, but with live view, not with the lens. I'm not using the zoom of the lens. I'm using the zoom of live view so I can go into that star. So you turn live view on and you press the zoom button on the back and you'll see it live view start zooming into that star. And immediately you'll see that it's slightly soft, most likely the nine times out of 10, it's gonna be soft right off the bat. But now as you slowly turn your focus, you'll see that little puff, it'll look like a little bit of a, you know, a cotton puff start getting sharper and sharper and sharper until it becomes a point. Once you're there, you know you're in focus. What I still do is I'll still do a test shot or two to make sure, take a test shot, you know, zoom all the way into that same star, make sure it's sharp as well. So those are my two techniques for focusing for stars and at night. If I'm in a scene like um, this here in Arizona, this is much more easy. Yeah, you may be able to autofocus. You know, there's some nice contrast going on there. So the camera probably should be able to autofocus. But if it's a scene like this, but more dimly lit, what I'll do is I'll take out my flashlight and point it at the subject I want to focus on and then focus from there. So that's where the, your, your flashlight will come in handy as well. So I use the uh, the flashlight to focus. If we're out shooting night skies and we're shooting something like a cactus in Saguaro National Park, what we'll do is we'll light up a cactus in front of us, not just to paint it with light, but also use that as a focus point as well at times. So using your camera so you can see through your viewfinder and focus, or if you have a bright enough flashlight, you might be able to make enough contrast in there that you can autofocus and then turn the manual focus as well. I talked about earlier about that 25 seconds, F2.8, ISO 3200, <laughs> and getting the right exposure. So one of the simplest ways to come up with the correct shutter speed so you don't get movement in your stars is called the 500 rule. And this is not by no means perfect science, but it will get you in the ballpark. And what this means is that you take your focal length and divide it into 500 and that will give you your exposure time your shutter speed the maximum amount of time you can leave that shutter open without getting movement in the stars like i said it's not an exact science because you have to deal with the um the solar equator and uh, declination and the angle at that you're kind of shooting at away from that solar uh e equator and that will affect it as well. But this does get you close. So if I'm using 15 millimeter or say a 17 millimeter, somewhere in that range, I divide it into 500. That gives me 33 seconds. I have found out that's a little too long. So that's why I end up going to 25. But if you end up using a different lens, say you use a 35 or let's go make it easy, a 50 millimeter because you want to do the... Um, center of the Milky Way, the galactic center, the brightest part, you just want that in your frame. So you're going to use a 50 millimeter. You now divide 50 in the 500, that's going to give you 10 seconds. So now that has made that because you went to a more telephoto lens, more of a normal lens instead of an ultra wide angle lens, it shortened amount of time because of magnification it shortened the amount of time that you can keep your shutter open and not get streaked. So you went from 30 seconds or 33 seconds at 15 millimeters 
down to 10. So that would be your starting point if you're using a 50 millimeter. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, I'll give my email address and stuff like that afterwards. If you want to send me some questions on this, I can. Um, I also use other things, but yeah, I forgot I put this one in there for you guys. So 50 in the 500 equals 10. Other accessories, like I said, the flashlight, uh, flashlight as well. Um, I meant to take this one out. I'm sorry about that. But the flashlight would be for uh, painting with light in the scene and sense. Instead of having the silhouette, I would uh, be painting this guy with a little bit of light. But in this case, I kind of I kind of like that silhouette of that. So here, uh, here's my information. You can contact me on Facebook, in Instagram, anything like that. Or you can email me directly if you have more questions that I don't get to tonight or you think of later tonight and you're just like, oh man, I meant to ask this question. I'll be more than happy uh, to help answer anything out there. So with that being said, I don't see, oh, where is, I'm oh, trying to get everybody back here. Okay, there we go. I think I can, <laughs> I can <laughs> yeah, do you, do you want me to stop this? You can leave, you, do you want to leave that up or do you want to stop the screen share? It's up to you. We can stop the screen share. It doesn't, I'm sure everybody got it. So. Cool. Um, okay, let's see, I think I can, I think I'll stop it for you. There we go. Um, all right, so uh, we do have one question from okay. Alan. He says, um, can I often have problems with condensation on my lens and camera? How do you handle this problem? Uh, condensation, what I usually do, if I know it's gonna be, uh, it, it, there's two ways you, you get it. You know, you can come inside from the cold, obviously, or go outside when it's moist and cold from a warm area. What I tend to do is if I know I'm going uh, into extremes where there's a chance of fogging and condensation, I keep my gear, my lenses and my camera body in a Ziploc bag locked it up because once you keep it in there and you seal it it's in that atmosphere it's not in the atmosphere of the room or the car you're in so you can open it up and you'll be pretty safe to have no constant uh, condensation or fogging or anything like that as the night goes on though that's a different story that's tougher uh, when you're out there and it starts building because it's a moist night or there's some dampness or or um you know a humidity out there it's just a matter of having a couple of lens cloths and stuff like that and constantly wiping it down. A good lens cloth, um, a lot of, you know, a lot of times people just buy, you know, like the 99 cents lens cloth, but a good, good one will help you keep your lens uh, from going up and stuff like that, so. Awesome. Um, Stanley has a question. Uh, does the 500 rule change for APS-C systems? It will. You're gonna want to say like with the 11 to, 20 because you have on the sony a 1.5 prop factor now you're going to factor it as a and this this goes down a rabbit hole because this uh <laughs> there's there is much more of a science and i can get into it more later on but what i would do is uh equate it as at 1.5 props so if you use 11 now do 16 something like that you know into it don't factor it as 11 millimeters factor it as 16 millimeters because of that crop factor that will get you closer to where you're going to go and there is a lot on the internet about that <laughs> so that's why i don't want to go too far into yeah. it but the safest bet i've done is just add the crop factor in and then go into 500 from there there's also um there's also some apps that could also you know get you precision if you want um uh the one that i like to use whenever i'm out doing really uh, anything. I use it for planning photo sessions with my clients too, but um, photo pills, oh. very, oh, yeah. it, it just, it, it's like a jack of all trades for anything you need out in the field. Um, it, yeah, it, so. it's amazing. If you want to do star trails, if you want to do anything, and it's just such a powerful, I recommend this to anybody who's going to go out and do photography. Uh, even, uh, the augmented reality where it uses the camera on yeah. your phone if you're doing a sunset and you're out say in Saguaro or something like that, and you want to know exactly when it'll be behind this cactus at what time and where I need to be, you can mark your spot at two o'clock in the afternoon 
and no, I got to be there at five o'clock. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. that's how cool it is. It's so good. Yeah, yeah I yeah. 100% agree. <laughs> um, I, I, I wound up doing this. So this kind of loops back a little bit to your presentation, um, talking about going back to a scene numerous times for a different sky, right? Um, mm -hmm. We at, we use uh, I was out to, uh, on a photo trip with a bunch of my friends and um, we were out in the Palouse region of Washington oh, right. yep. and uh, we planned it we used photo pills and augmented reality and all that stuff we planned where the Milky Way would be where we had to position ourselves we went out there during the day took pictures <laughs> of this one scene during the day then we went back at you know around sunset mm -hmm. um, and took pictures of this scene in, in that situation and it went back you know, at, at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., whatever time it was to do the the star trails and all that stuff um, right. with the Milky Way. So um, it's, it's it's kind of full circle, you know, like uh, yeah. it, it is it is a blast to um, to to see something that you don't get to see on a regular basis, because uh, literally I'm on the East Coast. That's on the West Coast <laughs> and, right. and be, being able to go to it three times in one day. Yeah, uh, is a it's a treat to experience that. So, the I, I recommend doing that for sure. And the Palouse yeah. is such an amazing area. I've only been there once, uh, but it is so unique. Uh, it's that one's back on my list of having to get back to for sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it um, the 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 very famous um, Windows XP mm -hmm. back, background is in California. Right. Um, which doesn't look like that anymore. Apparently now it, it's it's a orchard and stuff, so oh. you can't get that picture anymore. But you go up to Palouse, that's and, it, and you can now you can get it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, cool stuff. Um, there's no other questions. If anybody has a last minute question, okay. please um, right. please get it in real quick. Otherwise, we're gonna um, we're gonna wrap it up. But I want to say thank you to uh, Ken for. Um, you know, joining today and sharing all of your um, your your knowledge and advice for everybody who's interested in in night photography. I'm so glad that you shared different types of night photography too, because so many times when when you see somebody talking about night photography, it's it's one very specific kind, <laughs> and <laughs> you you did show that kind, but you also right. showed others, which I'm which I appreciate. Um, it's nice to see diversity. Right. And there's, there's something about the night that, yeah. uh, you know, I was, like I said, I just went down to DC, the, the shoot, the um, 11 to 20 and stuff like that. And I will admit the first place I go is to the world war II Memorial. And there's something about being there at night that and the Korean war Memorial, it just adds this incredible mood to it. And that's what, that's what I love. And that's why I like to shoot. Yeah. I love shooting stars and, and nightscapes and stuff like that, but shooting cityscapes or scenes of like the world war ii memorial can be just as exciting uh yeah. to shoot and a lot of people plus, forget yeah yeah plus uh, you're, you're also getting subjects people subjects that don't move right. <laughs> which, is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. which is really yeah. nice <laughs> <laughs> and you're doing such long exposures that if there's people moving in it they're not going to show up yeah you don't see them <laughs> right uh, that's, that's my that's my favorite part about long exposures is that you don't have to worry about anybody you just let it go oh yeah so, cool. Um, cool. Uh, thank you for everybody uh, for attending today as well, for tuning in. Um, uh, Ken did share his email address. So if you go back into the recording, um, you'll be able to send him a uh, question if it comes up later on for you. Great. Um, and um, so thank you, everybody. And uh, yeah, thanks, Ken. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks, everyone.